Hi, I'm Ali from Shanghai Zhan. If you like our show, why not support it with a small donation? Become a Shanghai Zhan patron by donating as little as five dollars a month, and you will get a cool Shanghai Zhan branded sticker. For ten dollars, you get one of our amazing Shanghai Zhan coffee mugs. Just go to Patreon.com/ShanghaiZhan to sign up. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Shanghai John. Thanks for your support. Welcome to Shanghai John, a raw and lively regular debate about China tech, advertising, creativity, platforms, and the intersection of it all. Join us each session for timely and relevant discussions on all things China marketing. We'll be joined by an entire spectrum of China experts, and you can learn more about Shanghai John at our website, johnstation.com. Coming to you directly from the city of Shanghai, I'm Bryce Switwam, and I'm Ali Kazmi. In today's episode, we're going to talk about SaaS. And SaaS means software as a service, and in marketing, it's normally a software platform tool that enables brands to make better decisions, automate processes, or even manage entire supply chain operations. SaaS platforms often only need a web browser to access and don't require massive hardware investments. Adobe, Salesforce, Shopify—they're all examples of large SaaS companies. SaaS, in effect, has really changed the whole marketing landscape. These SaaS companies, though, are massive throughout the world, but in China, their growth has been mixed, largely due to China's unique digital ecosystem, making it more difficult for the traditional SaaS players to expand here. That left the China market open for smaller players. And the question today is: Is there still room for SaaS platforms to grow in China, or have the big boys caught up? To discuss this and everything China SaaS, we are joined by Alex Duncan. He's the co-founder of Kwo, a SaaS company that helps global brands connect with their Chinese fan base on WeChat or Weibo, building brand authenticity with their audiences here. Originally from the UK, Alex has lived in China for ten years and has a passion for user experience backed up by brand and strong skill set in design and technology. And I should point out that today's podcast is sponsored by our good friends at Campaign Asia. Alex, welcome to Shanghai Zan. Thanks, Bryce. Great to be here. Yeah, I should probably point out that it's actually 15 years that、um, I've now been in China. I arrived in the summer of 2007. Well, wow, that's a typo. 15 years. That's amazing. And before we get started with Alex, we'd like to remind everyone that if you like the show, please give us a five-star review on your favorite platform. Apple Podcasts or Spotify both have places to leave favorable reviews, and it helps a lot. You've been here 15 years, Alex. How did you end up in China 15 years ago, and what brought you here? I came to China just literally looking for an adventure. I always sort of say that、um, my mother, in some ways, must have felt like she created a monster because. She always encouraged me to believe in myself and to believe that I could do anything and be anything that I wanted to be, and I actually went and did that. I just what decided I wanted to go abroad,、um, travel the world, and have an experience. And so, as soon as I graduated from university in England, I、um, literally bought a flight to、uh, Shanghai、um, with no plans, no hotel booked, no idea as to what I was going to do. And、um, yeah, I'm still trying to figure things out. Yeah, just like the rest of us, <laughs> definitely the case. So,、uh, tell us a little bit about Kwo and how the system works, and、uh, who are normally your subscribers. So, Kwo helps manage、um, four different social media platforms: WeChat, Weibo, Douyin, and Kuaishou. And if anybody on this listening to this is familiar with Hootsuite or Amplify or Sprinkler or Chorus or Sprout Social. Or buffer even, then Kwo is very similar to those platforms, except we focus exclusively on the China market. We are built in China for China, and we first started working on Kwo back in 2013, and we saw this opportunity to build a platform that brought all of these social media channels together. From、um, to help teams to be more efficient, so you didn't have to log in and out of all these different platforms, to be more collaborative. Because let's be honest, marketing is a team sport. It's not something one person does on their own. It requires a whole team to work together. 
especially if there's an agency involved, which I know you two know a lot about. And then the other thing is to help teams be smarter. Um, the reality is, and this has been studied many, many times, that only a small percentage of your content delivers um, the best results. And so our goal is to try and help teams that are creating content to understand which that content is so they can do more of it and um, build a better connection with their audience. And who are some of your big clients? Do you tend to work with foreign companies? You have local companies or is it a big mix? So actually, at this point, the vast majority of our clients are uh, multinational corporations. And um, that is kind of also an indication of where the SaaS industry is at this point of development in China. We're very lucky that we actually work in a space where we work across many different industries. So our clients um, range all the way from Nike, Vera Wang, um, Chomet, um, and luxury brands like that, all the way through hotel chains like Mandarin Oriental, Shangri-La, um, universities, and um, sports teams. We work with um, FIFA, the Bundesliga, and lots of European football teams, to actually individuals as well. Some of our, the accounts connected to our platform are um, the likes of Will Smith, um, Justin Timberlake, Taylor Swift. And we also work with B2B companies like Evonik, uh, Merck. So um, I, you're right, our clients are majority multinational companies. And that is, as I said, a state of the development of SaaS in China. They're the ones who are very sophisticated at using software overseas. And a lot of the time, the request to use our platform often comes from headquarters who say, well, we use this thing in Europe or North America to manage our social media. Is there a solution for China? And that's often where they uh, find us. And what normally is the transformation that you see pre K wall versus post K wall? What are you seeing in the transformation? What what kind of changes are you seeing in terms of their their social media planning or their execution? What are the big things that normally comes out after they use the system? You've actually touched on one of the hardest parts about um, running this very specific type of business, which I would say, um, although we are focused on um, social media marketing. We kind of fit into this more broad category of collaboration alongside um, platforms like Trello, Asana, TeamVision. And it can often be incredibly difficult to quantify the specific economic or um, results benefits of using a platform like ours. Because we actually help teams solve many, many hundreds or even thousands of small tasks. Uh, I often say that the key benefit of our platform is we'll help you take 20 or 30 things you do on a daily basis that take two or three minutes and we'll make them take two or three seconds. It's very difficult to translate that in terms of results. But I think the key thing that we um, help teams with is by being more collaborative, you create better content. I think we all know, having worked in agencies, that it is those um, points where you connect together and you have a meeting of minds and you also use the results of the data to inform making better decisions in the future. And so there are so many specific cases where um, we have actually been able to show teams data insights because teams are not spending hours pulling manually data together and putting it into a spreadsheet, putting it into a PPT. They're actually using that time to actually look at the, the results of the data and to learn what, about what they can do better. And how are you seeing the changes within the Chinese social media environment? As we move more towards video and live streams, is this still an important part of, of the social media mix that brands are still paying attention to? Obviously, social media is one of the key ways that all brands interact with their audience these days. And so that isn't really changing. Over the time that we've been running our company, we have seen a big shift much more heavily towards video. Obviously, that's partly because during the time we've seen um, 4G and 5G come along. So mobile devices have faster connections, which people are able to consume this content that previously wasn't able to load on these slower connections. But fundamentally, the key thing is that teams still struggle to really create a connection with their audience. And I think this is possibly worse in China than it is in the rest of the world. There's always such a stark difference between the conversations we have with teams in China versus at headquarters. Teams at headquarters are so much more focused on brand, understanding their users. Teams in China are often so in a rush to sell something. 
How can we get somebody to click on something and buy something? But ultimately, that rush to achieve a sale isn't building a long-term value of a brand. And so that's one of the big challenges that I think not just we face, but I think it's a challenge a lot of organizations face in China. Not everyone will understand SaaS and not everyone will kind of understand the benefit of, you know, of, of a Kavo type product, you know, and, and how it helps manage content on China's social media platforms. So a question for you is really around what's the connection between a content management and brand development? What metrics do you use or what metrics do you give advertisers or marketers access to through Kavo that translate into brand impact. If you could share that with our audience, especially those that are perhaps not as familiar with marketing or advertising and the connection between social media and advertising. That's a very interesting question. I feel like it's something that you might be more expert on than me, Ali, because what metrics you measure is so related to the outcome you're looking for. For sure, there are certain um, social media channels like Nike's store, uh, Nike.com Weibo account is run through our platform. And that is obviously one of their channels that is very focused on purchasing products. All of the content is about buying something and trying to drive clicks. And so they will be really looking at um, sales coming from that content. But then there are other accounts where their focus is just on building a stronger connection with the audience. And to be honest, WeChat in general is one of these platforms where it is far more about brand than it is about conversion. You know, WeChat is not that close to the point of purchase, even with mini programs and e-commerce integration. Most of the people that are on WeChat are not using that platform to try and buy things actively. You know, their searches for purchases are much more likely to start on uh, Taobao, Tmall or on somewhere like Xiaohongshu. So if you are a brand and you are creating content on WeChat, you should be thinking a lot more about the type of value you're creating. And so the metrics you really need to be looking at there is what is the open rate of that content? You know, did we create a title and a thumbnail that made people think that there was some value they wanted inside that article? And then another key one, which I see so few teams focusing on, is the share rate of WeChat content. You know, it's incredibly hard to gain WeChat followers. WeChat accounts take a very special place in people's phones, especially service accounts. They sit there next to your mum, your dad, your work colleagues, your you know, soccer club, whoever it is. And so if you're not pro sitting there providing value to that user, it just takes them to swipe across and unfollow your account. So every time you're pushing, if it's not good content, it's a reminder for them to unfollow you. So brands that are creating content on a WeChat service account really need to be looking at the share rate. How many of these people are taking this content that we're creating and sharing it to their friends? How many of them are sharing it on their moments? How many people are reading it when it's read um, through those shares? So these are the kind of metrics that we really encourage um, teams to look at. And the other key thing about these metrics is they are the only metrics you can see on your own account. If I had um, a dollar for every time somebody asks us about how they can monitor their competitors, we'd probably make a lot more money um, than Kwo does selling software. But the reality is there's so little data you can get on your competitors and how their social profiles are doing. In fact, on WeChat, there are just four things you can, four numbers you can see. And even those are not that informative. Whereas there's about 60 different numbers you can get on your own uh, WeChat account. And so really digging into those numbers, segmenting your content into different types. And I don't mean segmenting to different audiences. I mean, having a content strategy where you say, okay, we're going to talk this much about that, you know, tips and hints, we're going to do this much content um, that's about new product releases, this much content about um, the origin story of our brand, etc. whatever makes sense for your brand, and then measuring how those different types of content are engaging with your audience and adjusting accordingly. If there are things that you know you have to talk about through WeChat, but they're actually performing really poorly, then that's an opportunity to look at that content and go, well, how can we talk about it in a way that is more engaging and valuable to our audience? Can you give us an example? Like maybe maybe we take a football example or one of the football clubs or one of the MNCs that you work with and 
and maybe we can try to vocalize or at least verbally kind of explain how, what, how does content optimization work. So I can give you um, a very a couple of very specific examples. For example, New York City, um, up until the COVID pandemic, was um, a client we worked with quite carefully. And they were trying to promote um, tourists to travel to um, New York instead of going to Paris or San Francisco or, you know, another world city. And um, they had various different content they talked about, whether or not it was the food in New York. Now, probably the three of us would be much more attracted by pictures of a burger or a steak or dollar pizza. Whereas they discovered through uh, measuring their social media data that actually the pictures of donuts and ice cream and things that were maybe a bit more photogenic were actually getting them better engagement. They also, as an organization that is funded by um, commercial partners, they had this obligation to talk about all the different hotels in New York. And they learned that when they talked about a hotel individually, it was nowhere near as popular as when they looked at two or three different hotels and compared them in terms of their location, the price point, like the facilities they offered. And so these are just simple examples of where looking at your own data can give you ways that you can improve the way that you're communicating your message. This is especially important for international brands who are taking a brand that is potentially not that um, well known in the country and trying to work out what aspects of it connect better with the audience here. But increasingly with you know, this trend of Shachan of looking at the growth in lower tier cities, or um, you know, marketing teams in China need to be catering to multiple audiences inside their social accounts. You can't easily segment um, users from different tiers of cities. But I can tell you, you know, sitting here in a fourth tier city right now, the audience here needs very different types of content and has very different questions to somebody who would be in Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen or Guangzhou. In, Sh in Shanghai, coffee drinking is just ubiquitous. There are 7000 coffee stores, you know, hundreds of Starbucks, Luckin, etc., if you're in the French concession, you can't help but trip over coffee shops. There are just four Starbucks in this city. And almost every time I've been into them, they're very close to empty. There'll just be two or three people in there. So that culture of coffee drinking just hasn't really taken off here yet. And so there you've got different users in different parts of this vast, diverse country who have very different needs when it comes to the content you're sharing. Alex, one question. Are you also seeing in the conversations that you have with, with advertisers and brands, do they pick up this topic on private domain traffic? How much of, uh, of, of creating one's own audience uh, is part of the conversations that you have with clients? And, and are there specific primers for that? What do you see? What, why are brands looking at building out their own audience base? I often feel like one of my strengths and weaknesses in the marketing industry is that I don't buy into the hype. And so private domain traffic was first started being used as a term about three or four years ago until we wrote uh, KWO's 2022 Ultimate Guide. So it was about November last year. I had to sit down and work out what the hell this private traffic thing was. And I, I was not just about to use that word, which doesn't really mean anything to me. As And so I sat down to try and explain what it is. My understanding of what private traffic is, brands became fatigued from paying for ads on Tmall. They came, became frustrated by the limitations of how often they, they could post on WeChat and that their accounts could be easily unfollowed. So they started trying to set up e-commerce outside of Tmall, where they wouldn't um, be suckered in by all of these fees. They started to create WeChat groups where they could just effectively spam their users as often as they wanted. Now, WeChat, I think, quite wisely saw this and were like, OK, well, we're not going to be able to fight this. So we need to enable it in some way. So this is what I think it's one of the inspirations for WeCom. Now, WeCom allows companies to have these um, WeChat groups where you can have up to 500 people in them, um, you know, normal WeChat members, and you can communicate with them. You can build a community there. And then when we talk about private traffic in e-commerce, we're most of the time talking about mini programs, a place where you can sell without having to pay all these advertising fees. Now, these channels come with their own disadvantages. Sure, you pay a lot to Alibaba to get people to your store and to your product listings on Tmall. But 
you also are going to have to pay a lot to get people to your mini program on WeChat. It's not a case of build it and they will come. So then you're basically putting dollars into driving traffic to that store. And you're also putting a lot of effort into creating content and retaining these people in these WeChat groups. So I think there is value in private traffic. But it definitely has situations where it is a good idea and other situations where it isn't. And this is one of the things I've seen often happens with trends in marketing is there's so much FOMO that everybody thinks they need to be doing it. Like when it came to social CRM a few years ago, this idea that you can sort of segment and build profiles around their users. And we would talk to like FMCG brands that were trying to um, implement social CRM. And I just couldn't connect the dots as to why that was a good usage of their marketing dollars. This feeling of FOMO means that often people jump on trends that don't actually make sense for their brand. Like, do you want to be in a WeChat private traffic group for your toilet paper brand? Probably not. So this is where um, strategy should be used judiciously based on empathy for the customer and what it is that they need. Media uh, and the cost of media on platforms um, year on year is becoming a bit more inflated. So the, the cost of entry into, into advertising on platforms is also becoming more, more, more expensive. Uh, and you also mentioned that, you know, that, that fees to operate on these platforms uh, year on year also get very expensive. You know, it kind of becomes a vicious cycle. So when you go year on year, the the KPIs that you achieve year on year just become, you know, double digit uh, and the expectations become, you know, much bigger. I see the benefit or the value in in having your own traffic, Um, whether we call it private owned traffic or we call it social CRM or we call it WeChat groups. I think it's a combination of of influence and, and followers. The fact that people are willing to share that the brand puts out. I think KWO is in a very special place because you're helping brands create better content and you have data points against that. And the more value that you end up creating incidentally through the quality of the content, you're helping build that private traffic. Can I throw it back at you though? So you said that the getting the media buy is getting more and more expensive every year. How much of that is teams just not being more smart and sophisticated about how they're doing it. I can give you an example. Teams that manage WeChat accounts believe that 5, 6 p.m. To, or maybe to, until 8 p.m. on a Thursday or Friday is the best time in the week to publish their content. And so you will see a flurry of content coming out at that time. I can tell you from a study we did last year of 14,000 WeChat articles that as much as 15% were published between 6 to 8 p.m. on a Friday. And I can tell you that 6 to 8 p.m. on a Friday is not 15% of a week. It's not going to shock you to know that that is also the very worst time in terms of performance in the week to publish. And actually, if they published it two days later on a Sunday afternoon, that is one of the peak times in the week or a Tuesday morning, perhaps. So what I see is teams doing the same thing again and again and getting frustrated they're not getting better results but not taking the time to look at something so basic i would also argue this is a key example of a lack of empathy like how many people are sitting there reading wechat content at 6 to 8 p.m. on a friday or are they leaving work going home to spend time with family and friends and I think to some effect, it's also that the social media people are not able to translate social into marketing or brand. There's a number of issues, but you know, a lot of times, and you've probably seen this, a social media person at any advertiser is 25 years old. And so that person may not necessarily have the years of experience to be able to translate a social media result into a, an advertising or, or a marketing goal. Going back to my question, how much of this um, problem of, you know, things getting more and more expensive is that they're getting more expensive and how much of it is that teams are just not being smarter in the way they use these channels? I don't I don't blame anybody for this. We actually have an entire slide in our guide to China in 2022 on the industry situation, on the rising wages, on the rapid turnover, on exactly, as you said, the average age. And I think also I'm in this situation where I have my little sister who works for an agency in London and I get to compare um, like for like. And I, you know, my little sister has a master's 
in marketing and English literature from Edinburgh University, one of the UK's top universities. She then went to work in a small advertising agency where she worked with people in their 40s, 50s, veterans of the advertising scene. So it's not just the age of these people, but a lot of them don't have degrees. You know, we I don't think we've ever had somebody in our company who's been in the role of marketing who's ever had a degree in it, potentially a master's maybe, but they've also not had mentors too. And I can tell you my career has been heavily shaped by the people that I've worked for and I've been surrounded by. And so I think it is an industry that just hasn't had the chance to mature. But then I go back to this point about, you know, the whole topic of this podcast today is about SaaS. Now, why has SaaS not been as popular in China? Well, there's a few very key reasons. One of the big drivers for SaaS is economic. It's rising costs. Um, Peng Ong, the founder of Match.com, he said that um, no country will rapidly adopt SaaS until GDP per capita passes 10,000 US dollars. Now, China's GDP per capita just last year passed 10,000 US dollars. But there's some other cultural factors here in China. One of the things that happens with this quite young, um, not especially experienced workforce is they're not especially keen on transparency. They're not especially keen on collaboration because this often opens them up to what they fear is sort of being exposed, criticism, you know, mistakes being uncovered. Now, obviously, in order for us to achieve great things, we have to make mistakes as part of that journey. And so this is one of the key drivers we find when it comes to the adoption of SaaS in China, which is um, I've seen reports, a report from McKinsey estimating SaaS in China is the adoption is about 10 years behind um, the US. To give you a rough idea in terms of spending in the US, roughly $1 um, out of every two in marketing goes on technology. In China, it's roughly one out of every 20. So we're clearly in a situation where we're not yet in the age of SaaS in China. If you want any um, greater monument to the success of the SaaS business model, look at the um, Salesforce Tower in downtown San Francisco. It is literally an obelisk to the profitability of this business model. Mark Andreessen once wrote, the famous venture capitalist, founder of Netscape and VC behind Andreessen Horowitz, wrote an essay about how SaaS is, or software is eating the world. And even in the US, like a, some, I think in his essay, he gave an example of a piece of software that is used by funeral homes to manage funerals is a 100 million US dollar business. Now, we are clearly not at that point yet in China. There is so much potential in there. And there's a lot of things that have to change for this to happen. But China needs this. If you look at the growth of productivity in China, it has been lagging way behind the growth of wages. So teams are paying more and more to their staff every year. And their productivity isn't really growing. Now, one of the ways you can be more productive is by using software. You know, you turn that email chain, that WeChat chain into a piece of software where people collaborate. Instead of somebody manually pulling down data and putting it together, you bring up a dashboard in the marketing meeting with your client or internally with all the data automatically there, updated every five or 10 minutes. You know, these are ways that we can be smarter and we can make better decisions, which is going to give us a better return on investment than what we're seeing at the moment, where we feel like we're just spending more and more each year and getting worse results. And that's why you think that some of the big players like Adobe and Salesforce haven't really taken off here. It's not necessarily that they haven't tried or that the, the digital ecosystem is different. I mean, that was in the early days when we talked to Adobe about AEM and opportunities. And they just said literally that the ecosystem was completely different here and we just couldn't adapt it. Therefore, our system only works for, for Chinese brands who are willing to go out of China. So is it more cultural or is it that, that simply the ecosystem is just too unique here and therefore the, the big players haven't invested in local China solutions? It's a combination of those factors, Bryce. So, I mean, we saw actually when LinkedIn pulled out of China, LinkedIn had 20 something million, 22 million or more than that, maybe 30 million Chinese users. So they didn't pull out because LinkedIn had completely failed in China. They stopped providing content services here because the regulation made it so hard for them to maintain that social aspect in China. 
Now, China's personal internet privacy law, the latest of three rounds of regulation, has made it really hard for foreign tech players to operate in this market. But then, yes, there is also this cultural aspect. You know, we've built our platform specifically for users in China. You know, publishing a Facebook post or an Instagram post or a LinkedIn post is nothing like creating a WeChat post. WeChat posts are way more complicated. And even when it comes to um, the APIs and the things that you connect to on the other platforms, they are so different to the West. And the, the technical challenges of working in this market, I think, make it just prohibitive for those overseas players to be successful here. For them to have a real shot, they should try and build a separate product in this market or potentially acquire one of the companies that has built a product for this market. I always think that there's also animosity on the IT department side of a lot of companies here. Uh, when you go in and show them uh, a SaaS solution or something that would not necessarily that they had built, they'll reject it. They prefer to have something that they have created themselves and they've used uh, their own people or outside suppliers that kind of built a customized solution for them? For a long time, that was the case. But I think increasingly, we're seeing people see the benefit of um, SaaS. No, none of the companies that we work with could afford to dedicate the amount to building the kind of solution we've built. So they're getting a much better value for money by paying a subscription fee for our platform. And I think the other challenge is it's not just animosity from the IT department. There's also like animosity from the individual users. A lot of people, and Ali, uh, um, Bryce, I'm sure you will know this very well. A lot of people, certainly more executional in organizations, have um, quite a lot of fear of oversight and transparency and collaboration, even fear of repetitive work being taken away from them. You know, if you take away this downloading of data from this platform from me, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Don't make me do anything more complicated and sophisticated is kind of the sense I get from a lot of users. And I get it. They're in these situations where they're not, in, not entirely sure kind of how to do marketing well. And although we're coming along and saying we can help them do it better, they're quite comfortable doing what they do right now. Alex, what problems do you think remain unanswered in the SaaS business and influencer tech? And if there's any one thing that you would think the market would benefit from, what would that be? I am sure there are hundreds of opportunities in SaaS that um, remain unanswered. For me, it feels like this industry is still just at its starting point. I think the other thing about B2B or enterprise SaaS is it is pretty much never a winner-takes-all market. So actually, I don't expect KWO to be the dominant, you know, used by everybody player in this market. I expect there will be a whole series of different companies that will position themselves in different ways as there are overseas. You know, it's very interesting when we work with overseas partners to understand how they position themselves slightly differently. One is maybe more focused on metrics and measurement. Another is more focused on the actual content and the collaboration. Another is maybe more focused on compliance. You know, there are whole industries around the compliance needed by banks and by financial institutions. And so um, actually when with more regulation, as we've seen um, increasing in China, there will be opportunities for SaaS in so many different tiny niches. As I gave the example of Ma uh, Mark Andreessen's essay about um, software is eating the world, you know, there will be tiny niches um, which will allow for highly profitable and very successful SaaS companies to rise up in China um, over the coming years, especially with um, the spread of technology, as we've seen the vast investment in infrastructure um, we've seen across the country with 4G, 5G, and all of these um, this IoT connected devices. There's so much um, potential for SaaS. And we're also going to see a lot of more traditional product-based companies shift to more SaaS-based business models. We're already seeing that in China, where companies that make a particular piece of hardware are trying to increase the revenue and the stickiness with the customer by providing software on top of that. You're recognized in China as, as probably being one of the most successful, I would say, startups. 
uh, or software companies in China, especially within the expatriate communities. I can't think of very many people that have spent as much time as you have and that have spent as much dedication in the development, the creation of, of a product that's so attached to something that we use every day, WeChat. So how do you get inspired? And is there a community that you're attached to? What does the beyond the WeChat and beyond the cable, how do you inspire yourself and, and, and how do you get excited over new innovation, new things that are happening in this market? I'm very flattered by and can not really relate to your um, description of uh, my role in this community at all. But thank you very much for saying that. In terms of what inspires me, my journey to founding a SaaS company started a long time ago. I learned to use an Apple Mac in the early 90s. And that's where I started teaching myself to do design. I started learning to program as well. On my gap year in Australia, when I was 18, I really started learning how to build websites. This love of um, design and development really um, developed while I was at university. Even though I studied zoology, um, I was constantly um, honing these skills. And it was around that time that the blog TechCrunch came out and started blogging about the technology startups ecosystem. And that's where I think I really started to follow a lot of these companies. So some of the ones that have really inspired me are people like Basecamp, um, you know, created by 37 Signals, founded by um, Jason Fried and David Hanemeyer Hansen. You know, people who have a real passion for building great software that users love using. And I think that's still the thing that really motivates me at our company is finding ways that we can help users solve problems in really smooth, user-friendly, delightful ways. Those insights often come from spending time with users, sitting down, watching what they do, listening to them. There's always a danger that sometimes when you ask a user what they want help with, they'll ask you for help with something that actually really isn't one of their biggest problems. And then when you sit down and look at what they actually do and understand how they actually work, you actually see way bigger ways to help them um, and to improve their workflow. And so um, for me, it's finding those um, neat solutions to users' problems that help them to get on with doing their jobs better is really what inspires me. And then I guess, to be honest, the key thing about building a startup is it's all about the team. You know, although I might be the person that's on this podcast right now, my contribution to our company really is quite small. Like it's the people that do all of the hard work are the people who are have been dedicated for years, constantly iterating and trying to make us excellent, trying to take things that we've built and to improve them constantly. Again, that's that's the other thing is like having an awesome team of people who share this sort of passion for building an excellent piece of software, I think is what really motivates me. Are we ready for the A-B test, Ali? A stands for Ali, B stands for Bryce. I'm going to throw a bunch of words at you. You can only re- respond by choosing one of the two words, whatever is top of mind. And if you feel the need to explain why you chose what you chose, feel free to do so. I'm going to start off. Biology or mathematics? Mathematics, um, even though I actually studied biology at university. Um, giant or specialized? Oh, specialized, of course. Bearded or shaven? Bearded. Sleep or stress? Sleep. Men or women? Don't know why I said that. Why would I write that? I have no idea why I wrote that. Women. Uh, this, there was probably a good reason back in the time. Demographics or psychographics? Uh, psychographic. Uh, Douyin or Huai Shou? Douyin. You're a Douyin guy. Um, do you like starting things or finishing things? Finishing. Money or fame? They say that the they say that the secret to um, uh, happiness is to be um, rich and anonymous. But so I guess maybe I should choose money. I definitely have no desire to be famous. Pink or yellow? Pink. Excellent. Alex, thanks again for being on the show. It was really awesome. Uh, I really appreciate your responses. And uh, this is a fantastic program. It's going to be a huge challenge for me to edit this one down. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on today's episode. Join us next week for another exciting show. And to all our listeners, until then, have a great day. 